But I just want to give you guys, you guys were so awesome to support our youth as they headed to camp through giving, through prayer. Um, it was an amazing camp, and I had the privilege of being able to go with our youth. It was so amazing. We took 29 youth, and let me just tell you, I don't think there's even one that God did not do something in. And so this morning, um, I just want to read you a verse, uh, Psalm 145. It's verse 4. One generation shall, com shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Now, I love this because we get to hear from the next generation, and they're going to declare what God has done in their hearts. And so I want to invite West and Alex to come on up here. Yes, cheer. Woo! So I'm going to ask each of these gentlemen a question. Come on over here, guys. I'm going to ask them a question, and they have to try and do this in 60 seconds. <laughs> so my question to you is, what did God do in your life at camp? All right. Go ahead and take your uh, I'm Alex. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, I guess I kind of have like a little two-part testimony. So the first part is I was like in this class at camp. It was like how to hear from God. And at the end, they had everyone just like sit and quiet and listen. And I like asked God to speak to me. And I was like, well, OK, backtrack, sorry. <laughs> the last few months, I feel like God's been using me to kind of speak to and help the people who are younger than me. And um, so I was like, and just pray for people in general and help people. So I was like, God, I want to pray for someone. So and then it was just like guy in the Star Wars shirt. And I looked up, and there was a guy in a Star Wars shirt. So I was like, OK, God, if this is really you, have someone say, what's up to me? So I went and, like, gave Manny over here a high five. He was like, what's up? <laughs> so I went and, like, procrastinated for 10 minutes until I finally worked up the courage to pray for this guy. And then it was, like, a really meaningful prayer, and um, I feel like God used me. Amen. And um, I feel like that was God growing me in ways he's going to use me. And then the second part is... West was there. A lot of people were there. It was just this big prayer time we had, and we, like, stayed in prayer through it while everyone else went to free time and stuff. And um, I got prayed over, and these two people pro prophesied over me. West said that God, um, I was going to wield the sword of the Spirit, and God was going to use me, and people were going to hate me and try to hurt me, but they weren't going to hurt me, and that they would come to love me, and just that I would do great things. And then Mrs. Fox said she had a vision that I was standing on a rock, and the rock was God, and my feet were planted in the rock. And she said I wasn't going to waver. So, yeah. Say your name, same question, 60 seconds. Uh, I'm Wes Peterson. What's up, guys? And, uh, I went to camp. But first day, I wasn't expecting much. Just kind of get it over with. <laughs> but um, and then the first night, I well, during worship, I had a, for months before that, I had a, one prayer, one prayer cons consistently every night, be God forgive me, because. I, I've done, I did horrible things that I th didn't think God would ever forgive me for. And I, I prayed every night that I'd be free. And that night, I prayed that same prayer. And I just, for 10 minutes, the same song played. I, I, 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, my heart, like, became weightless. Like, it was amazing. It was an amazing feeling. My, the chains in my heart were unlocked, and my mind was free. I remember it, it was just, it was the most amazing feeling in the world. It was like Christmas, my birthday, Thanksgiving, all in one. It was amazing. Oh my gosh. And throughout camp, I just, I saw people with the same problems. And the chains were like, just in, their hearts were engulfed in chains and their minds were enslaved to sin. And as people were prayed over, the, the chains went away, and all they could do was cry at the feet of the Lord and say, thank you. And so I encourage anyone that has that problem right now that you please get prayer over. It's amazing. <laughs> amen, amen. Thank you guys for sharing what God did. 
There are so many stories, and I think that we're going to have the privilege of hearing a few of those um, over the next weeks. And so I encourage you, if you see a youth, ask them. Ask them. God worked in every heart, and it was amazing. So thank you for your partnership and your prayer and just holding them up that God would do something because he answered your prayers. Amen? So go ahead and stand up, cross the aisle, say hi to someone you did not come with today. church let's try that again you guys are too busy talking good morning church hey there you are we love to love on each other that's one of the things I love about our church family Uh, I know other churches probably like each other but we really like each other that's why I love doing our greeting time and getting to shake hands and hug Uh, we love doing that speaking of which uh, please 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 uh Carve out some space next week on your calendar after church to stick around for our Sunday fun day. It's a great opportunity. I know Rebecca already announced it and she already did a great job, but please be there. Be part of it. We'd love to get to know you and, and just hang out, spend some time. I know, I think our last Sunday fun day was like 8,000 degrees outside and all of you guys ran away and you were afraid, but stick around. It's all right. We will melt together. Uh, it'll be great. <laughs> But if you have a Bible, I'm going to have you turn to the book of Acts, chapter 8 and chapter 9. We're going to dive in today. And we've been in a series uh, called Encountering Jesus, looking at how different men and women in the Bible have these encounters with Jesus. And these one little moment, this little interaction they have with Jesus, it changes their life trajectory. It changes everything. And that's my prayer today, is that God would do something in your life. Um, And we're going to dive into the word. In fact, before we even go any one step further, can we just pray? Is that all right? Well, it's not. I'm going to do it anyway. No, I'm just kidding. I want to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. Today, as we open your word, which is living and active, this book, this is not just a book that was once spoken, but it's a book that still speaks. And so as we open your word, as we look at the life of a man named Saul today, I pray that God, you would speak to us a word that would change our lives. Maybe we've been thinking wrongly about who you are and what you're like. Maybe we've been thinking wrongly about what you can do in our lives. And today, as we open your word, we have open hearts to receive whatever seed you want to plant in us, whatever seed of faith, whatever thing you want to grow in us. Give us ears to hear what you want to speak to us. Give us hearts ready to receive and give us minds ready to understand what it is you have for us. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, 
Amen. Well, today, as you saw in my prayer, we're going to talk about the life of a man named Saul. The title of my message today is Transformed. And I want to talk about the sort of transformation that God can do in our lives. And today we're going to look at a turning point in the life of Saul uh, before he was to be renamed Paul. And this is the, the, the pivotal moment in one man's life, but it's more than that because we know that God went on to use this man to do amazing things for the kingdom of God. He went on to write many of the books of the New Testament, began to be a, a pillar in the, the, the early church, in fact, was an apostle and, and, and one that was sent to all these different regions. And by God's grace through this man's life, he was used to plant churches all over the region in the Roman Empire that existed during that time. And so we saw amazing things. But his life didn't begin quite like that. And like many of us, Saul didn't begin his life in the, you know, following God and doing everything perfectly. But on the other side of the equation, he thought he was doing what was right. But in the very beginning of his story, he wasn't, I'll just say it this way, he wasn't a fan of Jesus. And that's, a, that's an understatement, uh, just a slight understatement. He wasn't a fan of Jesus, but more than just not being a fan of Jesus, he actually was an enemy of the people of God. And I want to go a little bit into his backstory a little bit before we dive into his uh, the chapter 9. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to chapter 9 and turn to chapter 8. Um, but, but before we even see the apostle Paul, his name is Saul. And before we hear anything about him, we hear that there's this man named Stephen that was uh, a follower of Jesus. And he has this vision of the Lord, and, and he's, he's sharing unabashedly his faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And as he does so, the religious leaders are so incensed, they're so mad, that they literally stone him to death. They throw rocks at him until he is dead. And the Bible says that our character from today, Saul, was present at this execution of Stephen. Acts chapter 8, we're going to read just the first couple of verses, and then we're going to skip ahead. Acts chapter 8, verse 1 says, At this stoning of Stephen, and Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So real quick question, there's a test. Who was scattered? All of the disciples, right? Except for the apostles. All of the disciples except for the apostles. Number two, verse two. Devout, uh, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul... This man, Saul, was ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So I want you to have this picture in your mind's eye of, of who this guy is. Sounds like a nice guy, doesn't he? <laughs> Imagine someone coming in when you've got your girl group happening in your house and they're dragging people away and sending them to, to prison just because they're proclaiming the name of Jesus. That's what Saul was doing. Chapter 9 starts this way, and we're going to read quite a bit, so if you have a Bible, pull it out and get ready to turn through it. By the way, bring your Bible to church. It's a great place to bring it. Uh, I heard it wants to go on a field trip, so bring it with you. But Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1, says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. I'm going to say that again. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and he asked them for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he's been, he's been creating havoc in Jerusalem. And he's like, you know what? This isn't enough. I want to go to Damascus and I want to, I want to go there and arrest any other Christians that are there and bring them back in chains. Verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly, say suddenly. Suddenly. Suddenly, a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, the voice said to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. 
Now, the men who were traveling with Saul, they stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. But Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him to the, by his hand, and they brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. Verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, he said, Ananias. And Ananias said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. By the way, God is giving Ananias this word of knowledge. This, 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 he understands something that he has no earthly business knowing, that, that God is speaking to this man in this house, and he's waiting for him. He's, he's spoken to him and said, this is what's going to happen. God gives him this word of knowledge. But Ananias, he hears this, and he's like, Lord, I imagine he's kind of scratching his chin a little bit, you know, like, Lord, I've heard from many people about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And even here, he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed, and he entered the house, and laying his hands on him, on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, he doesn't say like, Saul, you jerk, right? It doesn't say that. Just want you to note that. It's not what it says. He says, Brother Saul. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, say immediately. Immediately. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and he rose and he was baptized and taking food he was strengthened then for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues saying he is the son of God and all who heard him were amazed and said is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of all those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring, to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and he confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the, the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior of the world that they were waiting for. He proved to them that this was Jesus. And the big idea today is this, and I hope you hear these words. God can turn any life around. He can turn our lives around for the good. That's right. You can celebrate that. Let's celebrate that. He can turn our lives around for the good, and he does it not by our strength, but through the power of Jesus' work for us and through the Holy Spirit at work in us. Amen. He transforms us from the inside out, from the inside out. Yes. He changes us. And I'll just tell you, that is my story, and for many of us in this room, that's our story of how God has taken us from brokenness and death and brought us back to newness of life and wholeness. That's what God does. And this is Saul's story today, but it's our reminder that God can turn any life around for the good. I love that song we sang. He picked me up, turned me around, set my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. Friends, that's what our God does. That's what he does again and again and again. And I love the story of Saul and his conversion because we don't find him. We don't catch him. What I love about this, the, the Bible is that like, it never like 
like de-emphasizes people's brokenness before they meet the Lord. You know what I mean? And even people, they, they, you, there's a lot of good lessons in the Bible on what not to do. You know what I'm saying? But what I love about Saul's story is it doesn't catch him like in a good spot. You know what I mean? Like none of us want to get caught like when we're doing something stupid. But Saul is like in the middle of trying to persecute the very Savior that died on the cross for his sins, the one that he would spend the rest of his days proclaiming and heralding as the best news the world had ever heard. But in this moment that God meets him, he's on his way to commit sin. I don't know about you, but I can, I can relate to that. I've, I've heard the Lord Jesus speak to me softly in moments when I've been on my way to commit sin. Come on. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Where the Lord has met me and stopped me and said, bro, what are you doing? That's how he speaks to me. He calls me bro. But that's the thing that he's out there speaking threats and murder against the Lord Jesus and his followers. And I love this story because he's out there and he sees this bright light. And then he's blinded by the light. Sorry. Some of y'all, you just got that song in your head, and I just got a point, because you just sang it. Awesome. You're welcome. Hope it's in your head the rest of the day. And he's blinded by the light, and he falls down, and Jesus speaks to him, and the, the people around him, they're not blinded by the light, but, but they hear the words of the Lord. And they lead him blindly into the city, and God heals him. And God fills him with the Holy Spirit. And God redeems him. And God saves him. We have evidence of that because immediately afterwards he gets up and goes out and gets baptized. As an outward symbol of what God has done inwardly. And there's an amazing thing that takes place in this moment. But what I love about this is that in, the, in between, he sits in darkness for three days. You ever wonder about that? Like, I don't think God put that detail in there by mistake. How, long, how many days was Jesus in the tomb in the darkness? Three days. And it's like, after he comes out of the darkness, just like Jesus was resurrected to newness of life, symbolically Saul is being resurrected to newness of life. He's no longer that old man. He's died and has been raised with Christ. Amen. And there's something new about this man's life. But Jesus sends, Jesus sends Ananias. And we're going to talk about Ananias in a little bit, but he sends this man who's an enemy of Saul, or vice versa, Saul is an enemy of Ananias. He hates him. He's speaking murder. And God sends this man to pray over him, to heal him, to fill him with the Holy Spirit. To, to baptize him even. Like, this is an amazing story. It's one that's, it's too, it's too out there for it to be anything other than by the grace of God. Only God could orchestrate that. Yeah. Only God could send someone's enemy to be the one that blesses and, and heals and prays over and prays the blessings of God over. You know what I'm saying? Like, like that doesn't happen in the natural world. Only God can do that. Amen? Yeah. And I'll just tell you, I have so many stories that I have in my life, personally, and in the stories of y'all that I've heard from and others that I've heard from, where I look at and I say, only God could have done that. And I'll just tell you, I think those are the kind of stories that give God the most glory, and those are the stories I love to hear and I love to tell as I'm reminded that, man, there's no way I could have got myself out of this mess. Only God could have done that. Only God could open that door. Only God could have healed that sickness. Only God could have set them free from those bondages, those chains. Only God can do those sorts of things. And four things I want to take away from the scripture today. Number one is this. Just one moment with Jesus can change us forever. Someone say amen. amen. See, we can be transformed by his grace. And he can transform and redeem our lives in ways impossible through any other means. See, this man Saul, who, by the way, from this point forward would be known as Paul. His life was so changed, God did rename him, gave him a new name. He was his chosen instrument. But, but in this moment, he was a murderous, vile, angry. I just imagine he's like a rage monster looking for people to throw in jail. And this is the one that Jesus says, I know that's the way everyone calls him. He's a rage monster. He's angry. He's vile. He's murderous. But when I look at him, I see a chosen instrument of mine. And I'm just, I'm baffled by that. Every time I hear that, whether it's in Simon Peter or it's in Levi or it's here in Saul, I think, 
Lord, what are the things that the world has been saying that I am? What are those identities, those false identities, those things that, that the world has put on me and said, that's who you are that I need to lay down? And more importantly, Jesus, who do you say I am? Because when Jesus saw this man, Saul, he said, he's a chosen instrument of mine. He's going to go before kings. He's going to proclaim the good news of Jesus before kings, high people, and all my people. Saul was given a new name. Verse 21, it says of Saul, after Saul was converted, after God changed his life, it says, and all who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the same man who made havoc in Jerusalem and of those who call on his name? Like they looked at Saul and they're like, this ain't the same guy. And let me just tell you, he wasn't. He wasn't. He was born again. He was transformed by Jesus, transformed by grace. See, Saul wasn't just given a new name. He was a completely new man from this one life-changing, transforming moment with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And let me just tell you, let me preface that. No, let me, let me add on to that and say the same Jesus who met him can meet you. Amen. The same God who transformed Saul into Paul can do the same in your life. I know because he's done it in mine. And I've got a long ways to go on that path of following Jesus to be more like him. But I'm on the road. And I'm following him. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. He is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and by the way, gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. We'll talk about Ananias. But God has reconciled us to himself, and then he's given us the task of saying, go and, go and bring people into the family of faith. Go tell people this good news of Jesus Christ. See, if anyone is in Christ, though, he's a new creation. That old Brian, he's passed away. He's dead. He's buried with Christ, and he's resurrected with Christ. I'm a new man. I don't just say that. But spiritually, I've been born to a newness of life. See, in Christ, you are a new creation. No longer does your sin from yesterday define who you are. I'm going to say that again. Your biggest sin from yesterday doesn't define who you are. You are not the greatest sin you've ever committed. You are who God says you are. And in Christ, you are a new creation. See, Jesus can do impossible things because nothing is impossible for our God. And when I look at Saul, I'm like, that's impossible. There's no way you could use that guy. And yet that's the guy that Jesus says, that's my guy. He's my chosen instrument. Because when people look at Saul, they're never going to be like, Saul was so righteous and good. That's why God chose. No, he was speaking murder. Like he was trying to like arrest the people of God. And yet it's that guy that God chose to use. So that no one could say, how great art salt. How great are Saul. He's so great. But they would say, how great is God? That God could transform and redeem his life. Number two, we're reminded that Jesus can transform any life and any one. He can transform any life and any one as long as we're willing to respond to his invitation See, when we come by faith, the scales are removed from our eyes and we can see God as he truly is. And I'm just telling you, friends, we've got a world that doesn't have any clue who God is or what he's like. You watch media, you watch depictions of, of believers, of, of God, of other things. It's like, you guys have no clue who God is. And when we come by faith in Jesus Christ, the veil is removed and we can behold the glory of God. And we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next as we, as we understand and recognize who God is and what he's like. And as we sit in the fullness and behold the glory of the Lord, we are changed. It changes us in a good way, in a good way. Verses 17 through 19. 
So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Now let me just tell you, I said this a couple weeks ago, that very often God doesn't do the same thing in the same way in different people's lives. Like when Jesus heals the sick man, like one of the sick man, like he, you know, blind man, he spits in his eye. He doesn't do that every time. He's not saying spit in someone's eye if they're, if they're blind. No, no, don't do that. But God doesn't often do the same things the same way. But, but I believe that, that what God was physically doing in the life of Saul, he's done in my life and he's done in yours. He wants us to, to go from a place of blindness to a place where we can see. Yes. A place where we're in the darkness, as we sang about in worship today, to going into the light. Because you've ever been in a place that's truly dark, like pitch black? You know, you can't see nothing. I know that's not good English, but it just sounds good. Like, you can't see nothing. And then when the light comes on, you're like, oh, I can see. And by that little glimmer of light, you can see all things. Jesus had a purpose for Saul, but it required transformation. And God's plans for you are not based on where you've been. They're not based on your experience, although, by the way, God can redeem your experience. We talked about that last week, how God can, can take the things we've been through, the pain that we've suffered and the trials and the tribulations and even the stupid places that our mistakes have gotten us, and we can turn that trial into a testimony. But I'll just tell you, your future is not predicated on where your past was or even where you're at today. God can, take, God can take a Saul and turn him into a Paul. He can take an enemy of the cross and turn him into the, probably the greatest voice of the gospel the world has ever known. Like he was an amazing, amazing apostle of the Lord Jesus. But to be transformed by Jesus like Saul, that we're not going to all encounter Jesus as, as Saul did walking on the road to Damascus. We're going to get blinded by the light. There you go. One more time if it wasn't stuck. God's not going to do that in all of our life, but we do need to see the light and to surrender to the Lord in his ways. And this metaphor of seeing the light is not one that's used just in Saul's story, but I think of John's gospel, one of my favorite gospels that tells the story of Jesus's life. It begins by saying, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. But for John chapter one, verse nine says this, as it speaks of Jesus is coming into the world. It says, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Who was coming into the world? Well, two of you got it. Jesus. Who was coming into the world? Jesus. Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, to his own people, but his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, what's his name? Jesus. Good. Some of y'all are wearing the t-shirt today. So those of you who believed in his name, Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, Jesus came and he came to bring light to the darkness. And that metaphor goes all the way through John's gospel, John chapter 3. Some of you are familiar with verse 16, and we're going to read it, even though you know it. But 16 through 21 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world, the light. He didn't send the light into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, and whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Verse 19, here's our connection. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people, they love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked hates does wicked things, hates the light, and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light 
so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So a little bit later in the Bible, John's first letter is called 1 John in our Bibles. He talks to us about this idea that we must walk in the light as he is in the light. And I'll just tell you, I, I do believe there's something important, there's spiritually significant about Saul sitting in darkness where he cannot see the light. After seeing the Lord Jesus, something changes. And the Bible says that it is up to us whether we will walk in the light or whether or not, what does it say? There's people that in, they see the light, but instead of walking in the light, they love the darkness. And I'll just tell you, God wants every area of your life and my light to be in the light. Sometimes we try and hold back, we keep things in the shadows, keep things over here. Jesus, I'm going to trust you over here, but I don't know why I'm going to let you in this closet over here because this is where I got all my stuff. And we got to open the door and we got to let the light in. We got to allow Jesus to transform us. And I believe that God was doing heart surgery in the Apostle Paul as he was still called Saul in that moment of darkness, as God was, was wrestling with him about those things, and he was wrestling whether he was going to surrender, and we know that he did because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was baptized, and he began following Jesus in a profound way. So you and I must come to the light. Jesus is the one that can transform us, but if we're going the wrong direction... These are in my notes, but it's the song we sang. He can turn our lives around. Set our feet on the solid ground. He can give us a new beginning and a new purpose as he did in his life. See, God can transform a life adding purpose, meaning, and hope to a life that others might look out and count as lost. And I'm just here to say, if you're lost today, he'll find you. If you're hopeless today, he'll give you hope that if you're going in the wrong direction, he can reset your course and the path of your life. Our God can do those things because he did it in Saul's life. He's done it in my life. Is there anyone here that you say that he's done it in my life? Give me an amen. amen. See, our God is in the transformation business. Yes. He can turn our lives around. And number three, we're going to shift direction a little bit, and we're going to shift from looking at Saul to looking at another man in this story, the man Ananias. And Ananias is little cameo in our story, because this is the only time he's mentioned. We're reminded that sometimes we're the target, and sometimes God wants to use us to be the arrow. And God uses ordinary people like us. Turn to the person next to you and say, like you. God uses ordinary people like you and me to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to bring others into the family of God. This man, Ananias, his story baffles me. I don't know why I've, I've read this story before, but as I was preparing for this message, I was, just, I was taken back thinking about this man who's heard the rumors of this guy, this can I just say, like, we would call him a terrorist. Like, there's like this terrorizer. He's a terrorist. He's come in, and he's just arresting people. Like he was in my friend's Bible study and he ripped the, the mom and the dad out and they went to jail. Like he's arresting men and women and, and hauling them off in chains. Like this guy, he's a terror, terrorist. And Ananias knows this man. He's heard the stories. He's probably got friends that were arrested. And Jesus comes to him. And apparently he's praying. Apparently, he's like receptive to the Lord because he has this vision. He's, he's in prayer and he sees the Lord and he hears the Lord. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Acts 10, 9, or 9, 10, I'm going to read it again. Ananias! And he said, here I am, Lord. He seems pretty receptive, doesn't he? Yes. He says, Ananias, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight and to the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. Like he's given him specific details. Sometimes I wish the Lord would give me specific details like this all the time. He doesn't, but sometimes he will. He'll give us a word of, of knowledge. He gives him a very specific word. He's like, I want you to go to the street. Here's the name of it. You're going to go to this house. This guy's name is Judas. And you're going to find a man named Saul of Tarsus. Like, like he's given him very specific detailed instructions of what to find. 
And he's praying, and here's what he's been, here's what I just showed him, and here's what you're going to do. He's seen this guy come in, and his name is Ananias. I already gave him your name. Lay his hands on him, and he might regain his sight. And I just look at this Ananias. I wrote down on my notes, little Ananias. He's just this ordinary guy, right? He's not like an apostle. doesn't say like he's the leader of his church. He's an apostle. It doesn't say, it's just as a disciple. Just a regular, ordinary disciple. Let me just tell you, there's no such thing as a regular, ordinary disciple. Okay? Yeah. So, let me just, let me just, I'm joking when I say the first part, let me just say the second part. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you're not ordinary. God's given you the same Holy Spirit that he gave to Saul of Tarsus. The same Holy Spirit that he gave to Peter. That he gave to Matthew and all the rest of the disciples and the apostles in the early church and those people that saw the powerful move of God. The same Holy Spirit was given to Ananias. And little Ananias is sitting in his bedchamber. I imagine he's praying. He's doing his devos. You know, he's opening his Bible outside of church, which you're supposed to do. And the Lord speaks to him. He's minding his own business. God's like, I got a, I got a mission for you. I want you to go find this terrorist I've got around the corner from you. I want you to go into his house, and I want you to tell him about me. You know, he's arresting people for saying this, but I want you to go tell him anyways. And Ananias is like, Lord, are you sure? Are you sure you want me to do this? But I just want to tell you, there are people around you today. There are people in your circle of influence today that God wants to send you to to share the good news of Jesus with. And I want you to hear me say that because I don't want you to hear me say, well, it's the pastor's job or it's the, the minister's job or it's the missionary's job. Say, God has people in your circle of influence he wants you to share Jesus with. He wants you to go pray for it because they're sick. He wants you to lay hands on them. He wants you to, to, to be with them and share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. See, Rebecca already kind of spoke a little bit about our grow groups beginning, but, but in the fall and as we go into uh, November and December, we're going to be starting our Jesus Disciple groups. And Jesus Disciple is really a whole new wave of training on how to not just, just be a disciple, but how to make disciples, how to, how to do the things that God has called us to do. Because we as a followers of Jesus, there's no little Ananiases. We're all disciples. And as a disciple of Jesus, we want you to know what it means to be a disciple. Like, what does God require of me to be his disciple? And how do I go and make disciples of all nations? Baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said. How do we do that? Well, we want to give you instruction on how to do that. So, but by, that, by saying all of that, I want to say, in our Jesus disciple, one of the things we're going to be giving you equipping on is this idea that we begin praying for the lost people around us. I think it's a very simple beginning point. I don't know what Ananias was praying for in his bedchamber or wherever he was at when the Lord Jesus spoke to him, but he was with the Lord and the Lord gave him a specific direction. He said, hey, go talk, talk to the guy with the Star Wars shirt on. Where are you at? Wait for the guy to say, son. But as we wait on the Lord and we ask him, God, I want to hear from you. I want to do what you want. He will. See, as disciples of Jesus, we're called both to follow Jesus, to be disciples, as well as to, to pray for and invite others to follow Jesus too, to make disciples. And I'll just tell you, that's my prayer, is that we would be the sort of church, we'd be the sort of people, the sort of disciples that would be disciples of Christ that we'd be disciples of Jesus, that we would follow in his footsteps and walk in his ways and seek to, to be like him and to know him and to serve him. But we'd also be a church that would make disciples. That we'd recognize that it's not just one or two or three or four or five people's jobs. It's all of our jobs as disciples of Jesus. Last but not least, and we're, we're done, don't worry. I'm over time. The music's playing. Number four. See, when Jesus transforms us, we are never the same as we once were. Because we've been born again to a living hope and redeemed and transformed from the person we once were to become the person God made us to be. I'll, I'll close with this scripture, maybe one more, we'll see. But 1 Peter 1 says... 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading, it's kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith. I want you to hear that. If you put your faith in Jesus, you've been guarded through faith. God's put a shield around you for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. See, friends, we have a Savior, and he's coming again. His name is Jesus. He is our Redeemer. He is our Restorer. He's the one that transforms us. And he doesn't just want to take us from a place of brokenness to wholeness, although he will do that. His ultimate goal is to take us from spiritual death to spiritual life. To resurrect us through the power of his resurrection and through the power of what he accomplished on the cross. See, Paul, as he would be known from this day forward, was never the same. God changed him. He gave him a new heart with new desires and was directing his life in a completely different direction. And I'll just tell you, he never looked back. I want to challenge you. As the scripture says in a couple different places, don't look back. Don't look back. Look ahead to the one who lies before us, the author, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning the shame. Look to Jesus. Because he is the one that will transform us from the inside out. He is the one that we've been made anew in Christ Jesus' name, that we might walk in the good things that God has prepared for us. So I want to pray that over us, because God can turn our lives around. Would you bow your heads with me as we respond in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word, which is living and active. God, wherever our lives are at, whatever the direction of our lives has been going up into this point, we thank you that wherever we are and whichever way we've been going, you can bring us home to you. I pray that we'd be the sort of people that would trust in you, that as we see the light, as Saul saw the light, that we wouldn't be afraid of it. We wouldn't tiptoe around the edge of it. We wouldn't just visit it weekly as we come to church or other places. But Lord, we live our lives in the light. That we'd bring our lives, every bit of it, under the lordship of you, King Jesus. Trusting that your will and your ways are so much better than the world's will, than the world's ways, than even our own will and our own ways. Help us to be the sort of people that trust in you. Because we I can recognize that you turn lives around not by our strength, but through the power of Jesus' work on the cross and through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. You want to change us from the inside out. And Father, today, if there's areas of our lives, maybe we've held back from surrendering to you. Maybe we feel like we've surrendered one area or two areas to you. But Holy Spirit, you know the things in our hearts. If there's areas of our hearts that we've been holding back from you, maybe it's a part of our life that we don't want to surrender to you. Maybe it's something from our past that we're, we're too uneasy to give up. Lord, today we trust you. And with hands held out before us, we just declare, Lord, we trust you. We trust that whatever you put in our hands is going to be better than what we have now. And whatever you want to take from our hands, it's better that we let it go. So today, if there's things that we need to let go, I pray that we bring them to the light, to you, King Jesus, the one who is light, that brought light to the darkness. And if there's things that we need to hear from you today, we say, God, give us ears to hear. Maybe there's a new name you want to call us. Maybe there's, maybe there's been lies we've been believing about who we are. God, speak to us. Reveal yourself to us in a new way today. We desire to know you personally, intimately, relationally. We thank you for your grace that you can turn Saul's into Paul's. So we thank you for your grace. And finally, with every head bowed and eye closed, maybe you're here within the sound of my voice and you've never made the decision to put your trust in the Lord Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. 
I'm here to tell you that you don't have to earn your way to God. You don't have to buy your way there. You can't serve your way into the family of God. But the Bible says it clearly that we come by faith in Jesus' name. It's by grace we've been saved through faith. It's not our own doing. So if that's you today, the Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. And if that's you today and you've never made that decision or you feel like I've wandered far from God and I, I need to come home, today is your day of salvation. With every other head bowed and eye closed, I just want to agree with you in prayer. I'm not going to call you down front or do anything weird or strange, but with every other head bowed and eye closed, if that's you today and you say, I want to surrender my life to Jesus, would you just lift up your hand so I can agree with you in prayer? Thank you. God bless you. I see you. Thank you. I see you. Thank you. I see your hand. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. I see you. If you're watching online today, God sees your hand right where you are. If you're on our patio, raise up your hand. God sees you too. But if that's you and you're praying this prayer, maybe for the first time, you can say these words between you and the Lord. You can say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins in my place. I repent of my sins and turn away from them. I ask you to forgive my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. I ask you into my life and heart to be my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I want to follow you from this day forward. And all God's people said, amen. Can we celebrate the Lord? Amen and amen. Well, church, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet.